waive the quorum requirements. Is there a motion to do that? Is there a second? second. Motion's been moved and second to waive the quorum requirement. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Next, we need to consider the minutes of November 16th and January, November 16th, 2023, and January 26th, 2024. Discussion to the minutes. We have a motion to approve the minutes of November 16th, 2023, January 26th, 2024. Is there a second? second? I'll place the motion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Minutes are approved. Thank you. Before we start with our agenda, I'd like to note that we're continuing with the new testimony process that we introduced at our last meeting in November. Anyone in the audience who is not scheduled to speak on an issue can fill out a testimony slip stating who they are and what their position is on an issue. Then they can either give it to uh, my, myself or a staff member. The slips may be found on the, the witness table. And you can uh, feel free to submit a slip on any issue. It doesn't have to be just this issue. You're welcome to slip, submit comments on any model law or resolution. So today we're going to start our discussion on the topic of state health care cost transparency requirements. To provide a little bit of background, in 2019, NCOIL adopted a health care cost transparency model law which you can view in your binders on page 269 and on the website and the app as well. The model requires drug manufacturers, PBMs, and health insurers to report certain cost-related information to the commissioner, and then that information is made public on the department's website. Per NCOIL bylaws, all model laws must be readopted every five years or else they sunset. Given the importance of this topic and the constant state of change in the overall healthcare marketplace, we're going to use the model being up for readoption as an opportunity to discuss the innovations and trends in the drug pricing and healthcare cost transparency arena since 2019 in an effort to see if any changes to the model should be considered or if it should remain as is. Before we go any further, I'm going to turn things over to the NQL president and sponsor of our model, Chief or Texas Representative Tom Oliverson. Please go ahead, Representative Oliverson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I'm very pleased to see uh, that the progress that we've made on price transparency in pharmaceuticals since this uh, model was first adopted. Um, you know, it's clearly struck a chord and. Um, I think it. I think it has. I know. I know for a fact that in Texas, it has uh, more than served its purpose in terms of informing legislators about what the ultimate disposition of rebates are and providing some clue as to why prices suddenly go up and things like that. Um, and so I feel like it's been a very, very good, uh, informative model, and uh, we certainly have more information to make better decisions than we did five years ago. With that being said, um, I would like to offer one technical amendment, uh, which I believe you have in front of you. Um, and all that does is clarify uh, that what we're talking about here are health carriers, health insurers. We were not intending to loop in um, workers' compensation or automobile or personal injury policy coverage. So. That's just a technical cleanup that was brought to me ahead of time before the meeting um, that I have agreed to take, uh, assuming the committee is, is good with that. And so I look forward to hearing from everybody today and uh, turn it back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. I do want to mention that this model or something substantially similar to it has been adopted in 16 states. So we have several speakers today to hear from, and we're excited about that. First, we'll get started by hearing from Lisa. Lisa, go ahead. We'll keep all our questions until the end of the present presentation. Okay. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and distinguished members for having me here today. My name is Lisa Joldersma, and I am a strategic advisor at Avalier Health. 
Avalier Health is a health policy consulting and analysis firm that has been advising clients across the healthcare market for more than 25 years. We do not lobby, and we aspire to be a neutral voice among stakeholders by publishing fact-based, timely insights into state and federal health policy deliberations. In recent years, of course, many of these deliberations have centered on ways to lower prescription drug costs for payers and patients. State policymakers like yourselves uh, have, of course, prioritized legislation to increase drug price transparency through mandatory manufacturer reporting of pricing information or advanced notification when prices increase above a specified amount year over year. Some states have pursued a more holistic approach, like the NCOIL model, that includes reporting requirements for health insurers and pharmacy benefit managers. While difficult to name a single cause for what impacts a market, we have seen moderation in price increases in recent years. And we do think that this is in part because of the reporting that would be triggered in the case of a price increase. For example, Vermont's Medicaid program explained in a 2020 report that compared to 2016, there was a 79% decline in the number of drugs reaching the state's per year price increase reporting threshold. The program report concluded that fewer manufacturers are excessively increasing the price of drugs. Similarly, Oregon's transparency program reported that compared to its first year of implementation in 2019, the program received 70% fewer reports for price increases in 2020. However, during that same time, Oregon saw a 15% increase in the number of drugs with high launch prices, and that's another matter uh, to keep in mind here. Vermont and Oregon's findings align with what drug pricing researchers have found generally, which is from 2016 to 2020, the amount of wholesale acquisition cost price increases among brand medicines have declined. Uh, federal policies that have been enacted more recently, including inflation penalties in Medicare and removal of the cap on rebates in Medicaid, could also further bolster the trend. Earlier this year, um, a pharmaceutical pricing analysis by 46 Brooklyn Research reported fewer brand drug price increases taken in January of 2024 versus prior years, and even noted some drugs had taken price decreases. The analysts characterized 2024 as, quote, a noteworthy de departure from the norm, marking a significant shift in the statistical trend since 2012 when they first began tracking prices. Focusing on these trends, of course, does not address prevalent concerns with the launch prices of newly approved medicines or with generic drug price increases and shortages. Transparency legislation historically has impacted brand manufacturers more so than generics and existing products rather than newly approved products. The same can be said about the federal approach to negotiating prices in Medicare. It remains to be seen what options the market and or policymakers may advance to address these additional issues. One thing is clear, however, and that is that patient groups become extremely concerned with policies targeting the new products that may represent their hope against untreated disease. And we saw that play out, for example, in Colorado last year when they declined um, to declare a breakthrough product for cystic fibrosis unaffordable, and that was in large part due to extreme patient concern. In sum, the evidence suggests that transparency measures have had an impact on brand drug price increases year over year. 
Sunlight on PBM and payer practices is more recent, but also gaining momentum. It may have a more direct impact on patient costs for medicines going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate that, Lisa. Okay, now we're going to hear from Scott. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Madam Vice Chair and members of the committee. My name is Scott Woods, and I'm the Vice President of Policy and Research at Pharma. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to um, speak to you this morning about prescription drug pricing, transparency, and improving patient access to medicines. Pharma has been a longtime supporter of meaningful transparency. Uh, that is transparency that helps patients, employers, and other stakeholders make better decisions in the marketplace without infringing on the ability of the private marketplace uh, to operate efficiently. Uh, and second, we've supported efforts to improve transparency throughout the supply chain. Uh, I want to thank uh, NCOIL and Dr. Oliverson for uh, their leadership uh, in uh, adopting this model back in 2019, it has set a, the bar high for accountability uh, and transparency throughout the supply chain. Uh, and as Lisa mentioned, many states since that uh, uh, adoption have, uh, you know, passed various transparency measures, some focused on just manufacturers, some focused on uh, other parts of the supply chain. Uh, but really, we've seen uh, really many states that have taken on uh, more comprehensive measures, and in fact, uh, the Congress, which oftentimes follows the lead of the states, uh, passed uh, the Lower Cost, More Transparency Act in December 2023, which really, uh, if you look at the, the legislation, actually uh, looks fairly similar to the NCOIL model in that it looks at um, uh, entities across the supply chain. Now, as we look at uh, what has happened in the marketplace and as you're considering uh, action uh, in this space, I just want to point out a couple of uh, facts and figures um, for you to keep in mind. Uh, at the macro level, spending on prescription drugs uh, accounts for just 14% of total healthcare spending in the United States. And this comes from the National Health uh, Expenditures Survey that's conducted um, looking at you know, not just prescription drugs, but costs uh, for providers, for um, uh, DME, all sorts of things, everything that goes into the pot in terms of uh, healthcare spending in the United States. And I think what really illustrates you know, that our, uh, that, you know, the prescription drug market is working uh, the way as intended is that, you know, throughout the course of this decade, we expect, uh, and this is not just pharma's analysis, this is IQVIA, that spending on re both retail medicines that you would get at your corner pharmacy and non-retail medicines, uh, so medicines that you would get at the physician's office or uh, in a hospital or other type of facility, it's projected to remain relatively stable uh, throughout the, the decade. And an analysis that was conducted looking at the Medicare Part D program, so this is the part of Medicare that uh, uh, provides prescription drug uh, benefits to seniors and those with disabilities, found that most, uh, actually vast majority of uh, Part D spending is for medicines that have competition, whether that's brand on brand competition or brands with generics. So the market is working. So now I wanna shift slightly to talk a little bit about where we at Pharma have been focused uh, and where we've seen a lot of state action and federal activity in recent years. And that's on patient cost sharing and access to medicines and what transparency really helps us to see where there are some uh, issues in the healthcare system. So many of these types of panel discussions can turn into a food fight uh, between uh, industries and we can lose focus on what really matters most and that is patients, your constituents, and I'm sure across the country uh, in hearing rooms uh, and around tables you have probably been confused and somewhat frustrated at times wanting to just get the answers to why uh, patients are struggling at the pharmacy counter. 
And I would say that a principal reason for that is that there are many entities in the supply chain that have an impact on uh, the cost of prescription drugs at the end of the day for the patients. Uh, and one major entity uh, are pharmacy benefit managers. Uh, our friends at uh, PCMA will say that it's pharma that sets the price of drugs and that's the end of the story. But really, uh, uh, pharmacy benefit managers and insurers play a really key role in determining whether a medicine is covered by an insurance plan, how much the patient is going to pay out of pocket for that. Is it going to be on a lower tier or is it going to be on a higher tier? Are there going to be various access barriers? Are there going to be prior authorization that's going to, or uh, other types of utilization management, fail first or step therapy that a patient is going to have to um, encounter as they are trying to get access to their medicine? Um, and the top three PBMs, I'm sure you all know this statistic very well, CVS Caremark, Express Scripts, and the OptumRx are the top three PBMs in the marketplace, and they control about 80% of the prescriptions uh, in, the, in the United States, and that is significant market power, one in which that many of your states are, are taking a look at, as well as the Federal Trade Commission, because this impacts uh, the, the prices that patients pay at the end of the day. Now, we've reached a critical inflection point where brand manufacturers, the companies that uh, do the bench research, do all the research and development, uh, and bring drugs to market, are now making less on those products than all other stakeholders. So hospitals, the government, uh, state and federal governments, uh, providers, pharmacies, um, insurers, and PBMs combined are now making more, at the end of the day, after all the dust is settled, after all the, the accounting is done, make more than the brand manufacturers who actually make those products. And uh, if you see on the right-hand side of the slide, that total brand medicine spending, again, after everything is accounted for, uh, it, uh, payers have, are, are now making 180% more than they did roughly a decade ago. But the key question is, are patients benefiting from uh, the discounts, rebates, everything that is going to payers? And despite increasing levels of rebates, discounts, and fees that are uh, paid by manufacturers to payers, uh, patients are often exposed to more, uh, more costs, especially those uh, in the commercial marketplace, where nearly half a commercial uh, market, uh, commercially insured patients are paying uh, for brand medicines based off the undiscounted list price of a medicine. Now that's very different than uh, the medical benefit. So I'm sure you know when you've gone to the hospital or you've gone to uh, your physician's office, even if you're in the deductible phase of your benefit, you're paying off the negotiated rate that the insurer has come to the agreement with with that provider. That is not the case uh, in oftentimes uh, for the drug benefit. So even if a patient is paying in the deductible phase or they're paying uh, a coinsurance, which is a percentage-based uh, cost-sharing arrangement, they're paying oftentimes based on the list price of the medicine, even though in many cases uh, the insurer or PBM may be getting a rebate on that medicine. So this is a very serious concern uh, for, for patients affording uh, for a patient's ability to afford their medicines. And of course, this has um, an impact not only on pricing, and I think we have, you know, in these types of discussions, a lot of uh, conversations about pricing and facts and figures, but again, to bring it to the patient experience, uh, you know, patients that when they get that high sticker price at the pharmacy counter, because they're in their deductible phase, because they're paying a coinsurance based off the list price of a medicine, they are nearly four times as likely for patients who are in the deductible phase to abandon their treatment uh, than patients who are paying based on a fixed copay, the traditional sort of $5, $10, $25 type uh, predictable type of cost sharing that you know, we might be accustomed to. And when a patient abandons the prescription at the pharmacy counter, that not only has an impact on future healthcare spending, a patient that might be returning to their physician's office or to the hospital because they haven't been taking their medicine, uh, but it also has an impact 
um, on, on health equity and patient outcomes. And I wanted to share this slide because I think it, uh, again, just kind of crystallizes the importance of these conversations, that it's not just about, you know, again, the facts and figures, but it's about the real patient impact. Um, and if you look across the, the various uh, disease states, uh, uh, diabetes, asthma COPD, um, behavioral health, uh, patients with diabetes, uh, hypertension, and HIV, the rates of abandonment, so this is for the first fill of a medicine uh, with, a, uh, with an out-of-pocket cost of $125 or more, which is not something that's completely unheard of, especially if a patient is in the deductible phase or paying coinsurance. Um, you know, the rates of abandonment are quite high uh, for African-American patients, but really for white patients as well, you see that the story is not any more positive, and, you know, this just illustrates why benefit design really matters. So I never like to leave these types of conversations without talking about solutions. So what do we do about it? I want to quickly just wrap up with some of our patient-oriented solutions uh, that we have been uh, advocating for uh, across the country. And really, the, this comes down to five uh, kind of key policy ideas. First, sharing the savings, the, the, uh, the significant rebates and discounts that manufacturers negotiate with pharmacy benefit managers and insurers. Patients who are taking those rebated medicines should benefit from those savings directly at the pharmacy counter. Second, making coupons count. So many patients rely on some type of cost sharing assistance, whether that's a copay coupon or some other type of uh, patient assistance. And there are many barriers that insurers and PBMs uh, put in place, whether that's accumulators, uh, which are now banned in something like 19 states, uh, maximizers and uh, alternative funding programs, which really target um, assistance uh, in patient assistance programs. And we want to make sure that patients have the ability to use those types of cost sharing assistance without any barriers uh, in the way of that. Uh, third, offering lower cost sharing options. So rather than uh, benefit designs that rely on deductibles and coinsurance, uh, providing more options for predictable cost sharing in the, in the form of uh, defined copays. Fourth, uh, covering medicines from day one. So rather than a patient that is you know, paying their uh, premium every month but not getting the benefit of the insurance um, from day one, making sure that more uh, uh, of that coverage is offered from the first day that a patient has um, their insurance benefit. And then lastly, hard dollar cost sharing caps. Some of your states have put in place these types of programs for um, uh, patients who are taking insulin. That's a really wonderful idea. And these types of um, cost sharing caps will really help patients um, uh, be able to afford their medicines um, again from day one. Thank you for your attention this morning. I look forward to the, the dialogue. Scott, thank you very much. We appreciate that. Jonathan, we'll hear from you next. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Jonathan Buxton with Pharmaceutical Care Management Association. Uh, we are the national association uh, representing pharmacy benefit managers. Uh, the role of the pharmacy benefit manager is to apply pressure on prices. We apply pressure to on my good friend Scott, who's a PCA, PCMA alum, by the way. Uh, we apply pressure on pharmaceutical manufacturers to provide the best net rate available for those drugs. We apply pressure on pharmacists to fill those drugs at an affordable rate. And the benefit is to the patient and the payer. Uh, there is no other aspect of the supply chain that actually is putting downward pressure on the price of drugs. And so that's the role we fill. And a lot of people like to call us the middlemen. We are in the middle. We are standing in the gap trying to make things more affordable. Um, and I know that the, uh, everybody loves to hate us. It's hard to hide the horns underneath this nice hair. Uh, but pharmacy, uh, insurers, uh, employers, Medicaid plans, uh, the government plans, everybody uses a PBM because there's a benefit there. And so this transparency model has done a great job of bringing in both pharma and PBMs. Um, I think that uh, in visiting with Will about the number of states where this has been adopted, I think y'all have sold yourselves short. There are over 28 states 
with some form of transparency reporting, reporting requirements. Um, not all of them include both all sides, but over 28 states have some level of PBM pricing transparency, and that's good. But transparency has got to be to the right people for the right reasons. You know, right information to regulators so that they know that the, the costs are being shared in fair and done right. Uh, transparency to employers and payers so that they know how to purchase better plans, uh, find ways to get those plans with lower cost sharing that make it easier for patients. Um, you know, driving around last night after dinner, we were talking about how much a crane operator would make uh, with all the construction here. It's, their average is $33 a, a an hour working in those high-rise cranes. The average crane operator does not care where the rebate goes or how much we're um, how much we're making Thank you. as different members of the supply chain for uh, the pharmaceuticals. They care how many hours they're going to have to work to afford their insurance, how many hours they're going to have to work to pay for the copay, or they don't care which pharmacy they go to. They just want to know which one's the easiest to get to and which one's the cheapest to get to. So. Providing transparency to the right part of the, the purchasing chain is more important than providing lots and lots of information. Uh, there was a state recently that had to roll back some of the premium transparency reporting requirements because they, the data was not accurate. It was too much data. They didn't even have the internal systems to be able to process it and collect the data. And so the pricing model transparency here in, at Incoil does a good job of saying, we're going to get high-level aggregated data so we can make informed choices as legislators, which is important, uh, and also so that our regulators can make sure that things are being done right. And so, um, in, in short, we support the model. Uh, we think the amendment makes a lot of sense. All, not all plans are the same, and so carving out those is, is, is ideal. Uh, we do thank Dr. Oliverson and this committee for their work on it. Um, like I said, 28 states are doing it. A lot of them followed y'all's uh, recommendations, and so uh, we would encourage you to readopt the model. Thank you, Jonathan. Appreciate it. Okay, Bailey, now we go to you. Go ahead and pull that mic over. There you go. Thank you so much. Good morning. Uh, hi, I'm Bailey Revis. I'm the manager of government relations at Families USA and head of our state and federal drug pricing work. Families USA is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that for 40 years has served as one of the leading voices for healthcare consumers. The high and rising drug costs of prescription drugs in the United States is both a profound health problem and a significant economic burden for our nation's families. Millions live in fear of not being able to afford their life-saving medications, and one-third of people are not taking their prescriptions as prescribed because they are too expensive. The financial, the financial burden of high drug costs is clearly felt by those taking prescription drugs, but it's even being felt by those that don't. When a drug company increases its prices, the amount the insurance company pay increases, and the monthly premiums are going to increase right along with it for everyone, regardless of if they are taking prescription medications. That also means if you're taking a prescription drug, your price is going to increase at the pharmacy counter potentially, but you are also paying that higher premium cost. You're getting hit twice potentially with the same price increase. For 176 million people in America who get their health coverage from the private market, drug prices account for almost a quarter, 22% of monthly premiums. Additionally, as healthcare costs continue to increase, companies and employers cannot provide the same increase in wages in order to offset those costs, meaning as drug prices increase, we see wages rising more slowly as a result. The incentives in our prescription drug market are clearly broken. Drug companies are incentivized to gain market exclusivity and ensure that they don't face serious competition, allowing them to raise costs year over year. Meanwhile, pharmacy benefit managers who exist to provide plans with relief from high costs are too often incentivized to consolidate and obfuscate the real prices being paid. In the end, the people stuck in the middle are the millions of families who end up paying the cost of these broken systems. Greater transparency requirements are a key first step to unveil those realities and bring down drug costs. Families USA believes that efforts such as the 2019 transparency model that take a comprehensive look at the prescription drug market are a key tool for states to understand and track a variety of data points on how drug prices are increasing and how that is driving costs at the pharmacy counter and beyond. Specifically, we believe that data points such as 
post wholesale acquisition costs, requiring justifications for price increases, and requiring plans to report on how drug costs are specifically impacting premiums and other healthcare costs are key metrics. We believe that there are also some opportunities to expand the model to make it even more effective, including improving the WAC reporting threshold to require a drug maker to report rationale for any price increases above the rate of inflation, ensuring public reporting of data provides as much detail as possible to help lawmakers, research, and the public hold the uh, entire drug market accountable and ensure competition across the drug market. And finally, expanding the model to require plans to report net price pay in order to determine if out-of-pocket costs are based on net price rather than list price. In addition to building out uh, transparency in the drug market, we believe that there are additional reforms that states can implement to help address the broken incentives that drive these costs. Reforms can include creating prescription drug affordability boards with other payment limits, enacting inflation rebates uh, when possible that create penalties when prices are raised above the rate of inflation, and when possible, ensure that 100% pass-through of rebates and cost-sharing that PBMs negotiate are passed along to the consumer so that they are paying based on the actual price paid rather than the list price. It is important to note that there are key reforms happening at the federal level that impact changes and opportunities at the state level. In 2021, as part of the Inflation Reduction Act, there were key changes made to reduce the cost for the millions that rely on Medicare for their health, um, for their health care. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, these major reforms, uh, are, several of which are going into place in the next few years, include uh, this year the final negotiated rates for the first 10 drugs will be announced at the end of the summer. CMS will also be releasing some information about how that price was decided and negotiated. We are hopeful that this information can be helpful to private payers and state payers to better negotiate their own prices. Um, those final negotiated rates for the first 10 drugs go into place in 2026. Additionally, next year, Medicare will put into effect a $2,000 out-of-pocket cap and smoothing, which allows Medicare payers to pay that $2,000 over the course of the year. Additionally, uh, on top of these existing reforms, uh, the U.S. Congress has been considering a variety of additional bipartisan policies that could be enacted sometime before the end of the year, many of which, as was noted, hinge on some of these transparency pieces as well. Uh, that includes reforms to PBM incentives, uh, such as in including improved transparency around negotiated prices, gross PBM profits, cost effectiveness of the PBM's drug prices, and spending patterns. All of this would help reduce drug benefit costs by increasing competition between PBMs and empower the clients of PBMs to negotiate better contract terms. Uh, additionally, Congress is also considering some bipartisan patent reforms that would crack down on things like patent thickets, product topping, and pay for delay. These federal reforms could dramatically change the broken incentive systems that lead to year-over-year -year increases from companies. However, in closing, I just think it's really important to underline the importance of state action to address these costs, even while federal action is ongoing. As administration and congressional majorities change, the priorities and opportunities can potentially change as well. However, all of the legislators in this room have the ability to ensure that the people in your state can get relief from these high and rising drug costs. Addressing these costs is overwhelmingly popular across the country, which I'm sure you're all aware as you hear about it constantly from constituents. Uh, but in August of 2023, a Kaiser poll found that 73% agreed governments aren't doing enough to regulate the price of prescription drugs. And when broken down, that was true for over 65%, regardless of political party. That is the level of consensus that, again, as we are all aware, is extremely difficult to come by on any given issue. Uh, we've seen dozens of states from all over the country, regardless of makeup or location, from California to North Dakota to Texas to New Hampshire, pass some form of legislation to get transparency and insight into high drug costs. There should be no reason that every state cannot advance further reforms to address high co drug costs, including the transparency model under discussion here today, if there is the will to move it. So thank you all so much and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Bailey. You appreciate that. Okay, James, now we'll hear from you. Thank you, Chairman Dunn. Go ahead and turn that mic right over to you. There we there go. You. Uh, my name is James McSpadden. Uh, I'm a senior policy advisor in AARP's Public Policy Institute. Uh, AARP is a nonpartisan nonprofit that fights for what matters most for the more than 100 million older uh, adults, 50 plus, uh, and their families. And at the AARP Public Policy Institute, we do research and analysis to support those efforts. Uh, at the Public Policy Institute, my work focuses on a range of health issues, uh, including prescription drug pricing, utilization, and access. 
I'm grateful for the invitation to speak here today since prescription drug prices definitely uh, impact older Americans. Uh, as a population, older adults uh, take more drugs than adults of other ages. We know that among adults 65 plus, 42 percent take five or more drugs a month, 18 uh, percent take 10 or more, and among the 50 to 64, more than two-thirds of this age group take one or more drugs. Midlife uh, Medicaid enrollees take on average 3.3 drugs uh, a month, and prescription drug utilization among uh, this age group enrolled in employer-sponsored insurance has increased 10% in the past five years. Additionally, older adults may not have the resources to absorb high and increasing prescription drug prices, and many are facing the real possibility of being unable to afford the medications they need. Uh, we know that uh, the median income of uh, adults 50 plus is just over 30,000. Uh, the median income of Medicare beneficiaries is um, lower than that, around 26,000. Many um, not having financial assets um, to absorb uh, these high costs. So because of this vulnerability, many older adults are concerned about being able to afford their prescription drugs. Our research has shown that more than half of all older adults are concerned. Uh, with adults 50 to 64 more likely to be very concerned uh, than adults 65 and older. Uh, with little recourse to address the high prices, individuals have been forced to make tough choices. Uh, some 20% of older adults have not filled a prescription in the last two years due to cost. Uh, and others have skipped doses, cut pills in half, or otherwise adjusted their prescription medications. Another reason that ARP has supported drug price transparency is because older adults themselves want the change. Uh, Two-thirds of adults 50-plus say that drug prices are unreasonable, and an overwhelming majority support uh, price transparency legislation that requires manufacturers and others to disclose how prices are set. The in-coil model uh, gets to the root of the concern, drug prices. Uh, while the model importantly addresses both launch prices and annual price increases, uh, I wanted to home in a little bit on the latter uh, in my time. Uh, ARP has been paying particularly close attention to annual pricing trends. For more than 10 years, we've produced a series of price watch reports to track uh, the price of drugs most commonly used by older adults. Uh, in our most recent report, or released earlier this year, ARP examined over 900 drugs, including brand, generic, and specialty, uh, that are widely used by older Americans. The report examined both retail drug prices and price increases for these drugs. Excuse me. The report found that uh, the average annual cost of therapy reached a little over $26,000 uh, per drug, and that uh, drug prices have consistently grown faster than the rate of inflation. Cumulatively, the average retail price of drugs has increased nearly 280% over 15 years. Uh, we also uh, produced a report uh, looking specifically at high-priced specialty drugs used to treat chronic conditions and widely used by older Americans. Uh, this report found that specialty drugs are the largest driver of price increases. In 2020, the average annual cost of therapy for the, uh, these drugs was more than 84,000. More than 40% of specialty drugs increased greater than 8% in 2020. And that the prices for 11 chronically, uh, chronic use specialty drugs that have been on the market for uh, 15 years increased uh, cumulatively by an average of 230%. Uh, these reports also show uh, the average annual increase of drugs widely used by older Americans alongside the rate of inflation. And you can see here that in 2020, uh, the average annual retail price of drugs was 3.1 percent, whereas inflation was 1.3 percent. If prices had been limited to the rate of inflation, uh, the annual cost of therapy would have been considerably less. 2020 would have been less than half, uh, around 12,000 compared to 26,000. Because price transparency is an important form, uh, important form of prescription drug reform, we have uh, supported passage of the model across the country. ARP state offices have worked closely with legislators and other stakeholders to pass it in a, uh, at least 10 of the 16 states. Uh, in one of those states, Texas, uh, which uh, certainly based its uh, law on the inquiry model, ARP was very active in support, and our Texas state office made uh, enactment of the legislation uh, centerpiece of its advocacy in 2019. In North Dakota, another state that utilized the in-coil model, uh, ARP has been involved in implementation. We've uh, analyzed the data uh, for the first year, provided a report to the state, um, noting that uh, manufacturer participation was inconsistent, the data reported were incomplete, and we made recommendations about how to improve uh, reporting process and accountability. 
ARP has supported price transparency not as a final solution, uh, but rather as a final step toward additional prescription reforms. Through the implementation of enacting legislation and collecting of drug pricing data, transparency can provide critical information for further analysis. Uh, information can show pricing trends and has shown pricing trends, uh, plan spending trends, and insights into pricing behavior. Additionally, this data uh, ultimately can be used by states to consider reforms that can bring down the price of drugs for state programs and for consumers. A few of those additional reforms we've supported at the state level, uh, prescription drug affordability boards, anti-price gouging legislation, interstate and intrastate bulk purchasing, and international reference pricing. So in conclusion on this uh, five-year anniversary, it's worth noting that the presence and proliferation of the NCOIL model demonstrates that current prescription drug pricing trends remain unsustainable. Uh, thoughtful efforts by states can help it, uh, provide evidence and direction to prescription drug reform and importantly can help ensure that all patients have affordable access to the drugs they need to get and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you very much, James, and thank you to our panel. Now let's go to the committee for questions. Senator Boyd. Thank you. Uh, one of the practices I hear a lot of complaints about as far as PBMs and price transparency are. So, you know, basically national average drug acquisition cost is a public number. Anybody can just go look up what NADAC is on any given day. Um, and so with that, one of the tactics that seems to happen is PBMs still pay below the cost of drugs, especially I'm, I'm not going to name PBM names or anything like that. They've all done it at some point in time. But one in particular really targets on brand name drugs and, and, and pays below that, that NADAC. Um, and so I guess my question is, is this really a tool to keep prices down, or is this something that is couched to legislators and, and other people who, who sign PBMs up, you know, um, commercial insurers or whatever, or is it really just a way to to move the marketplace to their mail order own pharmacies. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Uh, I'm shocked James didn't want to answer that. Uh, the way PBMs reimburse pharmacies is determined by the contract they have with the payer. Uh, and so the PBM enters into a contract for a pharmacy to be a network pharmacy. They agree to certain reimbursement rates. Um, anytime we end up paying a pharmacy more to fill a script, then it costs the payer and the plant, the patient more in premiums or in co-pays. So they use lots of tools to find the most affordable way to get a script filled. And in some states, I know NADAC reimbursement is the floor. And so that's, that's the, the, mo the least a, a PBM can pay uh, as long as they're a state regulated plan. So, so I guess the follow-up, though, is, is there are three major PBMs who control 80% of the market. How does the family-owned pharmacy really compete with that? Or, or is that really the drive is we don't need them, let's just drive them out of business, and then we'll fill up more prescriptions in our own mail-order pharmacies? Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Senator Gossage. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm just curious, of the states that have implemented this, what percentage of citizens actually access this data? Do we know? No. Um, my next question is, what kind of a cost is it to the PBMs, to the pharmaceutical companies, to the state to implement something like this, especially if it doesn't seem to be being used? Can anybody answer that? Finally, um, I write Medicare for clients all the time, and the Part D premiums this last year, due to some of the laws that were passed on the federal level, went up by 50 percent. Some of them went up by 75 percent. So we can say we're going to bring down the cost of the, uh, the troop or the true out-of-pocket costs for the prescription drugs, which is typically now 8,000 total, but very few people ever, ever get to that donut hole. Those that do oftentimes will hit it in February. And then they're in the donut hole, and then they try to get out of the donut hole, and they're out of the donut hole in November, and then they go right back and start this all over. So uh, the, the slamming down and saying, you know, we're not going to have people pay more than $2,000, or insulin's going to cost $35, 
all sounds really good, but then you're, caught, you're ch charging everyone more to pay for their prescription drug plan. Could someone address that? Hi, I'd be happy to. Um, I think that what we're seeing is actually Medicare will be able to bring down those premium costs, which have been rising year over year, partially in due to the high cost of prescription drugs that Medicare is paying, the billions and billions of dollars that they are paying every year. And by the ability to negotiate drugs, it'll be 10 this year, but it'll go up uh, year over year, um, up to somewhere around 75, I think, um, by the end. By negotiating the prices of those drugs and paying less amount, they are able to clamp down on those premium prices that we're talking about. And we actually, at Families USA, do have some concerns with capping the price at the pharmacy counter if you're not addressing that underlying price. But we think that that's why the Inflation Reduction Act handled that really well by providing an opportunity to reduce the cost that the payer is paying and also then pass that along to the person at the pharmacy counter. We think that having both of those is a critical tool to address the cost because otherwise, as you say, we'll just have increasing premiums if we're not reducing the actual price paid. Right, and I would also say as because a small percentage of those are using those very expensive meds, most people, most of the, the seniors that I talk to say, I keep hearing how, but tier one and tier two drugs are zero costs for most folks, and then they may pay 20% for a very expensive drug at the Medicare cost. So it would be those outlier medications uh, that very few people take. I'm glad to see we're going to try to do something about that. But also, that's a lot less expensive than what it would cost to have a heart transplant or something else if they weren't taking the pharmaceutical medications. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Next, we'll have Representative Sutton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think this question would probably go to uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Burton there. Um, regarding, first off, I do want to uh, thank you uh, with the average cost of crane operators. I'm going to go home and save some money. I've been paying too much for my crane operators. So that's a good thing. And for the edification of the body, as I passed by over there, I specifically checked uh, that is coffee in his cup, not the blood of children. All right. We saw earlier on the uh, on one of the slides that 50% of, of, the, of the savings that's generated isn't going to the end payers. And could you elaborate a little bit about where the system is, or first off, is that accurate? Secondly, where the system is broken and that would allow that to happen? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so that, that slide was uh, from Pharma, and it's research that they've conducted in multi years, looking at um, in the, the, the spending for medications. You know, if you have $100, who gets what? Uh, and they are right. In this latest report, um, Pharma, the manufacturers who make the drugs, <clears throat> on average, are getting 49 dollars out of that hundred dollars. The rest is being used uh, for, um, well, the rest is spent on us, on health insurers, on pharmacy reimbursement, on hospital reimbursement. And so it did cross, but the ph pharmaceutical manufacturers are still getting $49 out of that hundred. Um, incidentally, the reimbursement rates for independent pharmacists or pharmacists in that same study have gone up year over year. Uh, PBM reimbursement has stayed flat around 3%, I think. Uh, and so uh, that's basically everybody that takes a bite of the, uh, the medication expending dollar, how it breaks down. Pharma still gets almost half, just under half, um, and our spending has been flat on that at around 3%. Thank you. Representative Pollack. Thank you. Uh, great conversation. Um, I think the the senator or whoever asked the question earlier on about that independent pharmacist, and I think he was fixing to answer his question, and then we moved on. I'm curious to hear the answer to that. Here's the deal, and you mentioned it, um, uh, drug pricing gouging, I think was the word you used there. And, um, you know, I, I'm going to speak on behalf of the independent because I'm in Kentucky. Majority of our area is the rural area. These independent pharmacists who have basically, we're at 
over 50, close to 60, closing the doors because they cannot make, make, keep the doors open. And crazy as it sounds, their production of providing a service to their communities and rural areas are doubling. I mean, it ain't like they're not providing a service. Their service is doubling and they're losing money. That is a huge, huge problem. In the rural areas that I'm speaking on, and when we're talking about mail orders and all this, they just want to go to have a conversation with their local pharmacists who they trust, and it ain't all about making the dollar. It's about taking care of your people. It's about putting your pharmacy name on the back of a Little League jersey and those type of things. And so, um, yeah, it's kind of personal because I, I talk to these people all the time. And we passed a bill this past session. We're still in session. And trying to keep the playing field level right now, it feels like, or they feel like, and they've told me, we're in basketball in Kentucky. They're, they're shooting on a 12-foot goal, and PBMs are shooting on an 8-foot goal. You know what I mean? And so I hope you hear my passion about that. But I'm speaking on behalf of them. It is a huge, huge issue. Thank you for bringing this as a model. We need to make this right. We need to fix it and make it right all the way for everybody. Everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I have a question for Jonathan and anybody else who wants to weigh in. What are your thoughts on point of sale rebates where the consumer goes and it gets it at the pharmacy? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, one of the things that um, the vast majority of rebates are passed back to the plan sponsor based upon the contract they have with the PBM. Uh, those rebates are typically used to either offset premiums so that the patient is paying less in premiums or to offset cost sharing and things like that. When you get to point of sale rebates, you're taking those rebates out of the pool that's reducing premiums and you're putting it to just a pool for reducing the cost sharing for select patients. And so the problem with point of sale rebates is they, they overall will drive up the cost of the, of the premium and the patient, um, you know, that it will reduce, it will not reduce the, it will, okay. It will not reduce the cost sharing for all patients. It will only reduce the cost sharing for those patients that are taking those drugs. And it will increase the premiums and the cost sharing for all other patients on that plan. And I understand that concept. Thank you. Scott. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we have ta heard this refrain from payers a number of times. So looking at the commercial marketplace, which is where you know state regulators would be able to uh, implement a, this type of policy, uh, there are uh, a few states that have already taken this step, uh, Arkansas, Indiana, and West Virginia. West Virginia was the first state. Uh, looking at uh, the rate filings for uh, when West Virginia passed this bill, uh, I think it was in 2021, uh, they have not seen any market, uh, you know, out of anything out of the ordinary in terms of uh, premium increases in the commercial marketplace in that state. And what we've seen in the preliminary uh, um, uh, research from Arkansas and Indiana, the same uh, is the case for those two states. In the commercial market, Milliman did a study that looked at, okay, well, if you did pass along uh, rebates at the point of sale, the premium increase would be less than 1%. Now, there are figures that are different for the Medicare benefit because it's just a drug benefit uh, rather than, you know, being a medical and a drug benefit. So, uh, you know, saying that, well, we can't do point of sale rebates because uh, it's going to increase premiums, that's the answer that insurers are going to give about any type of reform to insurance. It's going to increase premiums. But really, the, the way that insurance should work is that uh, healthy people are subsidizing people who have illness. That's just the general principle of insurance. But when you're looking at these types of rebates, it's really sick people that are subsidizing uh, the premiums of healthy people, and that's just an inverted way of insurance. So patients that's taking a very heavily rebated drug and could benefit significantly at the pharmacy counter, saying to that patient, well, we're going to take your rebate, we're going to spread it across the whole pool, that doesn't help that patient that's trying to afford their medicine, especially as I illustrated through um, the data that we've shown that 
you know, those patients are increasingly subject to you know skyrocketing deductibles, skyrocketing uh, cost sharing uh, in terms of the, in terms of uh, coinsurance. So when it's you know the payers are saying, well, we can't do this because it's going to increase premiums, but then they're also increasing cost sharing exposure for patients. You know the question remains: Okay, well, why aren't you doing it? Especially when uh, you know Express Scripts. OptumRx, CVS Health are making these types of uh, programs av widely available in some instances uh, in the commercial marketplace. You know, it's just an answer. You know that you know they they just want to. We we can't do this because it's going to raise premiums. You know, their own members are you know providing this type of benefit, and they wouldn't be providing that benefit in the commercial marketplace if it in fact were uh, increasing premiums. You know, and their employer clients wouldn't want to you know take that option. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I hey, appreciate the questions and discussion. Now let's go back to Representative Oliver Sun for consideration of his amendment and the model. Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I really appreciate um, all the comments that we, we received. And uh, I, I will say that I do believe this model has been very, very successful as is. Um, and I heard a lot of good things. I would not at this time be inclined to open the model back up and, and do a whole lot with it. I, I think uh, Jonathan and Scott, um, both being in favor of this, uh, for those of you that weren't here when we were working on this, underscores the degree to which this was a, this w took a lot of work to get them on the same page on something that, that has clearly, as we heard, had a positive effect on lowering the cost of prescription drugs and educating lawmakers as far as, as where those costs are going um, and particularly where the rebate dollars are going, which had previously had been an entirely black box. Um, I know now in Texas, at least, that 98% of manufacturer rebates tend to stay either with the PBM or with the health plan. Um, I don't know what they do with it, but I know that's where they go because I know that's what they report to TDI. So I have that information. It's useful to me. Um, with respect to Senator Gossage's comments, we, we never really intended for this model to provide useful information direct to the patient because the information is being provided in an aggregate format. Um, but it was more an opportunity on one hand that the manufacturer would think twice about just artificially raising the price of the drug for no other reason than just because they could because it would trigger a reporting requirement. But also on the other hand, that the other players in the market, um, the health plan, the PBM, that they would be able to have to have some reporting requirement um, for the things that they were doing, which may be affecting costs. So the fact that it's not consumer friendly is, was not really the intent of it per se, um, but it was more to inform us. It was more to provide useful information to interested parties like AARP and others that would be concerned about the cost of prescription drugs. Um, so I would move that we uh, adopt this model for a five-year cycle with the one technical amendment that I'm proposing. I would also like to say, though, that I, I don't believe that our work in this sphere is finished. Um, and Mr. Chairman, I, I would support any efforts that you might undertake in future meetings to have a more robust discussion on pharmaceutical pricing. I, I heard several topics that I think would be worthy of discussion including the cost of generics, launch prices, um, the effect of copay assistance cards, particularly as relates to the value of rebates and where they go. Um, I think also we haven't actually heard in this discussion from our pharmacy friends. Uh, the pharmacists are obviously, and pharmacies are obviously part of this discussion as well. Um, and I know that there's some concerns that have been raised to me with respect to third party discount cards that are being used, which are on top of essentially what the, the in-network price would be. Um, and Scott and Jonathan, you may want to cover your ears, um, but I would tell you that my personal bias is, having worked on this issue for years, that if I could eliminate all manufacturer rebates tomorrow and force these guys to negotiate direct with one another based on a number of covered lives discount per plan, I would do it. But that would require a change to federal law. Um, because I do think that the main cost driver that is accelerating the unaffordability of prescription drugs is the rebate itself. And the fact that that rebate never seems to find its way back into the hands of the consumer. So I thought, Mr. Chairman, that your question about 
the point of sale rebate was a very interesting question because the reality is is that these rebates very often don't benefit the consumer when you look at what Medicare does with the rebates that they get on insulin rather than give those rebates to the people who are taking the insulin they tend to use those rebates to keep everyone's Part D premiums down, which kind of supports Scott's supposition that you know you have the sick essentially subsidizing the healthy, um, which is not really the point. So I think rebates are terrible. I wish we could abolish them. Um, that's my personal bias. Um, you may not want me to have any more models, guys, on this, but <laughs> that is my personal preference. So, um, and then of course the the patent thicket issues and the pay for delay things are are also worthy of discussion by this group, although that would be probably more appropriate at a state federal type uh, committee setting since we can't control what the FTC does. Um, but there is a tremendous need for reform there. So uh, if it's okay with, with the group, I would move that we adopt this model, readopt this model for the full five-year cycle. Rep representative, let's uh, move the, mo the amendment first. Okay, so I would move that we adopt the amendment. Second. Okay, we have a mo the motion and a second to adopt the amendment. Is there discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. The amendment is adopted. Representative Oliverson. Now may I uh, move, Mr. Chairman, that we adopt the model for the full five-year cycle? The motion is to adopt the model. Is there a second? Second. It's been seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. The model is adopted. Thank you, Representative Oliver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, next on our, uh, thank you for our panel. We appreciate your being with us. Next on our agenda is a presentation on site neutral payment reforms. Let me provide a brief background on the topic. Last year, NCOIL adopted a hospital price transparency model law, which requires hospitals to disclose certain pricing information in a clear and understandable manner. People want and deserve to know how much a hospital procedure is going to cost. Shouldn't be a complex and vague thing to deal with, and patients deserve to know how much care is going to cost before they show up. So building off that topic, we're now going to discuss another hospital pricing related issue, site neutral payment reforms. Generally, these types of reforms focus on requiring one price for a procedure wherever it is performed whether procedures done in the doctor's office, a hospital, a clinic, or a, cl a clinic owned by a hospital, or a different entity. So with us today, we have Randy Chapman and Stuart Hagen of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, and we have Joanna Hyatt Kim of the Hospital American Hospital Association. We'll hold questions until they're finished, so Randy, please go ahead. Can you all hear me? Oh, yes, you can. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak today. And um, also thank you to Will and Patrick and all the INQUAL in staff for all of your help and for a great meeting um, in my wonderful hometown of Nashville, Tennessee. Um, so I'm going to start today with a, a quick story. Um, this is a story of Kyung Yi Lee. Um, Ms. Lee suffered from arthritis in her finger joints and um, received periodic steroid injections for as her treatments for that. Um, she received those treatments from the same physician in the same place for years um, at a cost to her, out-of-pocket cost of about $30. One day she went in for her injection appointment as usual, but one thing was different. Her doctor's office was now on a different floor. Same building, same doctor, different floor. But when she received her medical bill, there was one more difference. And instead of the $30, roughly $30, that she usually paid out of pocket, her portion was now over $350, 10 times more than what she had paid in the past. That sounds outrageous to me, and it is. And from the perspective of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, BCBSA, which my colleague Stuart and I represent, we think that type of scenario occurs all too often. So before we unpack how Ms. Lee ended up paying, owing over 10 times more for the same service from the same doctor in the same building, very quickly, just some background on BCBSA. 
So the ECVSA is a national feder federation of ind independent, community-based, and locally owned, um, locally operated, sorry, Blue Cross Blue Shield companies. And collectively, we serve and support and cover one in three Americans in every zip code in all 50 states and Puerto Rico. The Blue Cross Blue Shield Association and BCVS companies are committed to advancing common sense solutions that can improve care and lower costs. And we're committed to tackling the key drivers of rising costs and ensuring access to high quality affordable health coverage for the 115 million Americans that we serve. So, all right, so let's get back to how Ms. Lee got here. Well, we think, and research shows, that key drivers of increased costs are provider consolidation and hospital billing prices and practices. And for years, we have seen um, a growing trend of corporate hospital systems taking over independent doctor's offices. And often, after the hospital takes control, what was a doctor's office is now considered a hospital outpatient department. And with that change, the hospital is able to charge higher rates. So care designated as being delivered in a hospital setting costs up to 300 times more than care delivered in an office space setting, which leads to situations like that of Ms. Lee's, where patients can receive the same care from, in the same room from the same doctor, but at a much higher price. Our colleagues at Blue Health Intelligence recently performed a national analysis of over 123 million member claims for 34 commonly administered procedures um, that occurred between 2017 and 2022. And through that research, they discovered that hospital outpatient department prices grew rapidly with a 27% average increase compared to an 11% average increase for care that's provided in an ambulatory service center, or ASC, and a 2% increase over care provided in physician's offices. The prices for common procedures performed in HOPDs are substantially higher, sometimes five times more expensive than when performed at an ASC. And while there's some variability in prices and costs by site of care, across census divisions, the HOPD prices and costs were always higher. And the research also found that policies aimed at creating site-neutral payments could result in substantial savings for patients, businesses, and employers. And now I'll turn to my colleague, Stuart. Thank you. Go ahead, Stuart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the, over the next few slides, I'm going to go over some examples, but they're, um, they're, they're just examples of what we see as a broader trend in general. But in this case, and this comes from the Healthcare Cost Institute, which includes, they do research on the commercial claims of insurers like Blue Cross Blue Shield, as well as a handful of other of the large uh, national insurers. And uh, for, in this example for a, uh, an endoscopy, um, from 2009 to 2017, uh, the price in the office setting went from 463 to $527, an increase of 14%. Um, that's over eight, nine years. That's a, that's a good distance of, uh, amount of time. In the, at the same time, there, there are two things going on with uh, that price in a hospital outpatient department. First of all, the prices start at a much higher level, and then they grow more rapidly. So in this case, went from 1,500 and, and change in uh, 2009 to nearly $2,700 in 2017. That's an increase of 73% compared to 14% uh, for uh, the same procedure, the same procedure de delivered in the office setting. Now this is an example, this is from research that is just on Blue Cross Blue Shield claims. As Randy mentioned, uh, this is some uh, work that we did with our colleagues at Blue Health Intelligence. Um, and uh, it's the uh, results of, of uh, a couple of studies that we did this past fall. Uh, one study published in September and the other in December. 
And in this first, this is, a, and it, it, again, this is what we see, have seen broadly with many different procedures, and we're just going to give you some examples here. So in this case, let's look at the office again, and similar to what uh, HCCI found from an earlier, somewhat earlier period, um, the, the uh, price of a cor corticosteroid injection for back pain was much smaller, much lower if it was delivered in the physician office. In 2017, it was $394. Five years later, it was $426. So this is considered by far the lowest of the three different sites. And, and then if we go to the um, hospital outpatient department, well, we see a similar kind of not very fast growth in the price if, the, if this um, procedure was delivered in an ambulatory surgery center. But if it was delivered in an HOPD, then we see this big increase in price over time, as well as the prices themselves being quite high. So in 2017, $1,350 if it was delivered in an HOPD, compared with that $394 if the same procedure was in a, in a physician office. By 2022, the price was nearly $1,800. So it went from $1,350 in five years to $1,800. Um, so what we're seeing in general is that HOPD prices have been considerably higher to start with, and then over this period, they're getting even higher compared with other sites of care. Let me just uh, show one last example. <coughs> Excuse me. This is the price for... Uh, chest x-ray, very common procedure. In the physician office in 2017, the price was $44. Now it did, in this case, in the physician office, we're not showing it in an ambulatory surgery center because that happens very rarely. So we just aren't are excluding it from this one. In this case, the price did uh, jump quite a bit in 2020 for the office. It went from $44 to $95. And then settled down, and it's at $101 in 2022. In uh, the HOPD, uh, by comparison, starts out at $126 in 2017, then quickly jumps up to $305, and then to $341 in 2022. So these are all, these are all common uh, procedures, but they're also common examples of what we have seen when we looked at uh, many different procedures um, over the course of these two studies that we did last fall. Thanks, Stuart. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when hospitals acquire physician offices, they often uh, change the, um, the way that the practice bills insurance. And so when they do this, um, you know, they do this by using the hospital national provider identifier or NPI number and the hospital claim forms. Um, and then the insurer, the payer, will reimburse at the hospital rates. And so because the insurer has no way of differentiating between the more expensive care provided in a hospital versus uh, care provided in um, a physician's, you know, physician office setting, which is much, le much less expensive. And more importantly, it's difficult to apply the correct cost sharing for patients, which often results in higher prices, which means higher costs for consumers, and that's how Ms. Lee ends up with a bill 10 times greater than what she was paying before the hospital bought her physician practice. And so, um, you know, as always, we want to offer solutions and not just come to you all with a problem. Um, and, you know, as we think about our shared role as insurers, as payers, um, and, you know, as well as as legislators, um, that role is to protect consumers and patients from unreasonably high health care costs and to expand coverage. So, for example, we applaud the work that NASHB is doing on affordability and their proposal to prohibit facility fees for services delivered in non-hospital um, emergency department settings. But we think there's an opportunity to build on that and even go one step further towards site-neutral type policies in the commercial space. And so we support state actions um, that would require hospitals to use appropriate billing forms and NPI numbers based on the site of care, not based on who owns that site of care. And that would allow payers to correctly identify the site of service and the claim and then provide the um, appropriate reimbursement rate. 
We welcome the opportunity, of course, to partner with NCOIL and, and continue talking with you all about these issues um, and, and talk about our shared mission to lower costs and increase affordability for patients. Um, as always, we're happy to take questions and, again, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Randy and Stuart. So on that happy note, let's go to our hospital representative, Joanna. Good morning. My name is Joanna Hyatt Kim. I'm vice president of payment policy at the American Hospital Association. We represent almost 5,000 hospital and health systems across the country. To start with some level setting, I want to state that access to quality care is the top priority of hospitals. To achieve this, we need appropriate health care system financing that covers costs and provides some room for capitalization. Part of this is health care coverage that is adequate and affordable for the individual's circumstances. Site neutral payment is part of this equation vis-a-vis -vis the adequate financing part of the equation. The term refers to policies that purport to pay the same amount for the same service no matter the setting. However, in reality, the services provided in different settings is not the same. The standard and level of care provided in different settings is not the same, and the patients served in these different settings is also not the same. Hospitals have unique characteristics and capabilities that we all have an interest in maintaining. First, regarding the services provided not being the same in each setting, chief among these is hospitals' provision of emergency services 24-7 to all who need it, regardless of their ability to pay. It's among the most, if not the most important function that we provide. But emergency services are provided via standby capacity. What that means is that physicians, nurses, and other clinicians are standing by, waiting for patients to come through the door for care. They're waiting for responses to natural disasters like tornadoes, hurricanes, wildfires. They're waiting for infectious disease outbreaks, of course, such as COVID-19. And standing by at every moment of every day necessarily means that there will be times that there are not very many patients needing care. What that means is that standby capacity is not something that is explicitly reimbursed. It is funded through the reimbursement for other services. And as such, it is endangered by cuts to reimbursement, including site neutral cuts. Hospitals, of course, provide a lot of other specialized, unique capabilities that are also endangered by cuts. This includes the burn units, the neonatal units, infection control, and disaster preparedness. Some of these are very costly services because they're so specialized and they are not completely reimbursed by the payment rates. Some of them are in the vein of standby capacity where there is no explicit reimbursement for them, and so they are funded through the reimbursement for other services. Regarding the care provided in different settings, as I said, site neutral is based on the idea that the care is the same, but this is false. Let's take the example of a 40-year-old woman who needs an MRI. She is having trouble swallowing. It's getting worse. And her internist sends her to a freestanding imaging center. She gets her MRI, easy peasy. She's in and out. Compare that to an 80-year-old man at a care facility who has dementia. He throws up, but he cannot tell anybody why he might have done that. And the care facility is concerned that perhaps he swallowed something. They send him to the ER which is a very typical response at these facilities. He's disoriented, he's agitated, the technicians help him get into his gown, and everyone decides that a light sedation would help get the MRI accomplished. What this means is that that must take place in an open MRI machine, which is a more expensive machine, because the technicians will need to hold his hand, reassure him, remind him to keep still. Even so, it may take two, three tries to get a clear, still image. The technicians help him get dressed and help him get back to the care facility. This has taken four times as long and many, many more resources. But in the claims and the coding, it looks exactly the same. Regarding, for example, another example, 
obstetric ultrasounds. These are very rarely done in, let's call it an a la carte manner in hospitals because they're very commonly done in other, other settings, which means that when they are done in a hospital, it's because somebody is generally coming through the ER. They have pain, they don't feel right, and it's not that they come in and say, I need an ultrasound, and then it's given to them. What, they're, what it initiates is an entire diagnostic procedure that involves clinicians trying to determine what's wrong, and maybe they do eventually conclude that an ultrasound is needed, but again, this has taken more resources and more time, and it's not an equivalent service. And then finally, I'll give the example of infusion therapy. This is a different, higher standard of care when it's provided in a hospital. Hospitals provide sterile conditions with a licensed pharmacist. They use barcoding to ensure that medication errors are not made, and they are overseen by, to name a few, the FDA, the U.S. Pharmacopeia, and the Joint Commission. Finally, the patients served in different settings are also not the same. Hospitals provide services that are not always otherwise available for historically marginalized and low-income patients who are more likely to be duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid, more likely to be, for example, non-white. Medicare beneficiaries with cancer are four times more likely to seek care in an HOPD versus a physician office. And again, they are more likely to be duly eligible and non-white. Diving into the specifics on why cuts would endanger patient access to care, Medicare, of course, is one of the largest payers of hospital care, and it is not even remotely covering the cost to provide care to Medicare beneficiaries. Hospital Medicare margins have hit a record low. The Medi MedPAC payment, Medicare Payment Advisory Commission estimated that in 2022, Medicare hospital margins were almost negative 13%, and in 2024, they will fully reach negative 13%. We estimate that med the Medicare payment shortfall totals almost $100 billion annually. And of course, other payers do not re fully reimburse the cost of providing care to their patients either. Medicaid across the country pays 87 cents on the dollar, which nets us another $31 billion annually in underpayments. Hospitals provide quite a bit of uncompensated care, either to uninsured or underinsured patients, and commercial payers are becoming a huge challenge for hospitals. They routinely deny appropriate care and delay payments. In fact, 50% of our hospitals report that they have $100 million in accounts receivable that are older than six months. And that is the environment we are currently operating in without additional site neutral cuts. Any additional cuts would be hugely de detrimental to patient access to care. For example, some proposals would siphon $180 billion out of hospitals and health systems over the next 10 years. To give you a little bit more magnitude and context, these are some state level cuts of what actually are, is one of the smaller scale proposals in the Congress right now. And you can see that for many states, this would yield an excess of $100 million over 10 years in lost funds coming to your state. Of course, payments are one side of the equation and on the other side is costs. The pandemic and subsequent inflationary environment has been a huge challenge for hospitals. Our input costs have risen substantially. Leading the way is the acquisition cost of pharmaceuticals, which has gone up almost 37% over three years. Patients are also staying longer in the hospital because of workforce challenges at downstream discharge destinations that cannot accept as many patients as they used to. And then patient acuity has also gone up as delayed and deferred care is working its way through the system after the pandemic. Hospitals are also economic engines in their communities, so hospital cuts could not only result in loss of access for patients, but also job and economic losses for the broader community. 
To circle back to the beginning, providing high quality care is hospitals' top priority, but they need adequate financing to ensure that they can do this. They are already facing gaps in reimbursement and site neutral cuts will make that significantly worse. Hospitals cannot continue to provide the full scope of their critical, unique care if payment is less than cost. Access will be reduced, and this is particularly true for rural and underserved communities that tend to rely disproportionately on hospital care. So I thank you for the opportunity, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Joanna. So to the committee, we still have two more items on our agenda. So we'll take three comments or questions on this. And if you could be succinct, that would be wonderful. We'll start with Representative Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I'm, I'm completely sympathetic to the hospital situation. I just think that it was unfortunate that whenever this policy of site disparity was created, that it was done on the backs of patients and private care. Um, I think Ms. Chapman uh, said how much the employed physician has increased. And, and what has driven this, for you have not been involved, I saw it first in cardiology. The, uh, the cardio I mean, a patient would go to the cardiologist, get an echocardiogram, cost $160. And for you who don't file insurance, there's a professional fee and there's a facility fee. And the facility fee is where the real differential comes in. So that exact same cardiology office, the exact same quality of care, the exact same ultrasound machine, she went back to have the same echocardiogram after the hospital bought the practice $6,000. We're not talking about inpatient care. I realize they see more acute patients. We're talking about hospital outpatient care. And what that has done, it has really forced private practice to sell to hospitals. And so now, even the AMA is reluctant to take a position because more of their members are employed physicians than they are in private practice. So the, private, the hospital employed physicians who were forced to sell their practice because they couldn't get reimbursed at the hospital rate are now scared to not take the hospital position on site neutrality because they, they're, they're concerned their, their salary will be reduced. So that's where we are. I, this is a I mean, if a patient has $2,500 deductible, they're paying all of that fee, that, that fee differential. So I used to say Marcus Welby's dead and we killed him, but I realized that show ended in 1976 and nobody knows who Marcus Welby is but me. <laughs> but, <laughs> But, um, I, and the other thing that bothers me about all this, uh, and this was the concern when private practice started advocating for site neutrality, is the $80 billion that was to be uh, saved in, in, pa in payment neutrality, we, we were hoping we would have some leveling of payments, but instead of leveling of payments, they're just reducing everybody and if any of you have had parents, it's very difficult to find a specialist, much less a family practice person, to see a Medicare patient these days. You may have your family practice person, but when you get ready to be referred to a specialist, it's almost impossible to find somebody. So I, I know you're not Medicare, but I guess my, my concern with CMS is take this $80 billion and start doing some levelizing of payments, particularly in the outpatient setting. I think your inpatient hospital argument is valid. But I think hospitals have to find another way to be compensated. And, and the other thing, I think the dish and uncompensated care is not based on actual uncompensated data. But maybe if you can have a comment on that. Sorry, we don't, I'm sorry, we don't have time. We, we have two more items to, to go. And so we're going to hear from two more committee members, be succinct, Delegate Westfall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I got concerned with this because it might be site neutral, but it's not equal. In West Virginia, we've got about 75% of our people are on Medicaid and Medicare, and then we've got PIA, which only 10% more pay than what P, uh, Medicare does. Uh, our private pays like 19%. Our hospitals struggle now. If you did this, we put some hospitals under. Um, I just don't see this. I mean, 
it's apples and oranges to me. It's not the same. Because a hospital 365 days a year, seven, you know, 24-7, where a physician's office is 9 to 5. The cost is totally different, and this would really, really hurt hospitals in West Virginia. So thank you. Thank you. I know there's others that want to comment, but our last comment will be Senator Hackett. Yeah, and I, and I appreciate it. I was on a hospital board for a long time, and we went, in, we went in periods where you never had hospital employees, and then the same consultants would, would come back and say, now we want hospital employees. But the movement today, by far in Ohio, is the doctors are, are, are household employees. I mean, are hospital employees. The biggest problem, and, and I don't know why the Hospital Association doesn't say this, is you have to buy their building to get, their, to get them in as employees, and why you won't say that. I mean, when you talk in there, when they come in to see me about hospital facility fees, you know, I, I just say to them, you know, why do you pay so much for the building? And they laugh. They say, you're right, that is a big, big problem in that scenario. So I wish you would say, I agree with everything else you said, but I wish you would say. The second point is hospitals have greater negotiated factor than doctors do. So that's a big thing. It's much easier for hospitals to get their fees approved and network fees approved with the insurance companies than it is for the doctors because the hospitals can, can, can collectively come together. The doctors can't unionize it. I'm not saying they should, but they can't unionize and they can't do that. But the only thing I wish you would say is you have to buy the doctor's building. The doctor won't come in and be an employee if it's building. And you don't want their building but you have to buy their building to bring them in. So I, I just want people here to realize is, you know, when the, when the employees come in, they buy the doctor, the hospital buys the doctor building, and their, their ability to use the, uh, uh, you know, to charge a facility fee, they don't even want the building. I mean, the building really, I don't even know if it qualifies. You see there's ways to, to say it doesn't qualify. But, but you know, you're going to say, hey, we're gonna, it's a way to pay back. It's an ROI. We can get a, a bigger fee. You know, by charging that, but that's the whole problem: is we got to buy the the building of the doctor to bring them in as an employee. Thank you, Mister. Thank Chairman. you, Senator. We appreciate that panel. Thank you very much. I'd invite the committee and the panelists to engage post committee if you would like to. Uh, but we thank you very much. Next, we're going to go on to item number five. It's a quick update on how states are done with regard to uh, Medicaid redeterminations post pandemic. We have uh, Miranda from America's Health Insurance Plans. We've had updates on this topic throughout the past few years, and now that we're fully removed from the pandemic, we thought we'd get another update. And why they're settling, I'll make a quick comment on Representative Oliverson's transparency. He and I talked, and just to be clear, his model act is not intended to apply to the PNC piece of the in insurance world, but just as was outlined in his model act. Miranda, go ahead. Thank you very much, Chairman, and I will uh, be brief. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come back and provide a quick update on Medicaid redeterminations and really what the data is telling us. I'm Miranda Motter. I'm Senior Vice President of AHIP. Uh, so again, appreciate the opportunity to be here and am privileged to really talk about three quick things this morning. One, wanted to just provide a quick update relative to the data that we are seeing from March to December of 2023 relative to what is happening with redeterminations. And I will quickly say that this is data that is being reported in a uniform way from states into CMS. So I know that there is a lot of different kinds of reporting out there, but this is what we're focused on today. And this link that is included here provides specific information for states if you're interested, and I'm more than happy to pull that moving forward. Essentially, where we are with having to redetermine 94 million individuals, we're about two-thirds of the way through. Coverage renewed, about 53% of Americans have had their coverage renewed through Medicaid. Um, the coverage levels in terms of terminations is at 24%, so 13.7 million Americans have lost uh, their coverage. Some of that has been because of procedural terminations. That is hovering currently around 70%. That is varied in certain states, and I will tell you some states have actually penned uh, or, or um, paused uh, those terminations to make sure that they can do additional outreach for individuals. Um, as you can see there. The second um, 
bucket of data that I wanted to share real quick again is where are individuals going that are no longer individual for Medicaid. So as of October 2023, you can see here in federally facilitated marketplaces, nearly 4 million Americans who lost their Medicaid went through some level of process in the marketplace. And I guess I would point your attention to the 4 million that went to the marketplace and then to the bottom number of the 1 million consumers that actually selected a qualified health plan. So that means they actually selected a health plan in the federally facilitated marketplaces. In states where there is a state-based marketplace, again, that data is as of December 2023. Again, I would call your attention to the 4 million individuals uh, that went to that marketplace in those states, and then a half a million individuals actually selected a qualified health plan. Obviously, there are levels in there, the marketplace given um, the application process, who may be eligible for subsidies, all um, differs. And so again, I would call your attention to those two numbers. The last thing just quickly wanted to um, provide a quick update on, I think since the this group last had an update about Medicaid redeterminations, was that there has been a number of guidance that has been issued by CMS. Um, just very quickly, uh, special enrollment period, so individuals who lost coverage as a result of this have uh, a special enrollment period in the marketplace through November of 2024. There has been general guidance issued by CMS to states really outlining 10 different areas, reminding states what the federal rules are as it relates to eligibility and enrollment. There has been guidance issued to states to really continue to encourage them to work with managed care plans uh, relative to contact information, relative to transitions, really helping individuals complete those application forms. There are new resources um, for families that may be and individuals that may lose those medi that Medicaid coverage through the fair hearing process. And then last, um, in December of 2023, CMS did issue additional guidance that um, given that there is a high level of kids that are losing coverage, about four in 10 that are losing coverage are children of those states that are reporting ages. Um, and so CMS did issue uh, some specific information to states to make sure uh, that kids um, could continue to uh, remain coverage, reminding them of the requirements and then also providing some strategies um, and flexibilities through waivers that states could apply for. And with that, um, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I can turn it over to JP. That was really good. Very succinct and good information. I see no questions. Thank you very much, Miranda. Okay, our, our next item on the agenda is introduction of a value-based purchasing model act and i'll turn things over to senator mary filkowski thank you mr chairman i'll be very brief as this just is meant to be an introduction of the bottle and then we can fully discuss it at our next meeting you can view the model in your binders on page 275 and on the website or app i'm very supportive of this model and i sponsored it identical piece of legislation in my home state of wisconsin the model is very straightforward and it simply creates authority for states to enter into a value-based purchasing agreement with a drug manufacturer. Importantly, there is no requirement to enter into these agreements. The model just creates the authority if the state wants to do this. And what we're mainly driving at here is the fact that our medical treatments continue to advance. It's opened the door to a wide variety of medical solutions, especially when dealing with very rare diseases. But the cost of these treatments are extremely high. Sometimes these treatments can actually exceed upwards of a million dollars. So a value-based purchasing agreement aims to ensure that the cost of the treatment is based on the value that it provides to the patient. And this is done through an agreed upon metric between the state agency and the manufacturer, stating what benchmarks need to be met in order to receive the full payment. I'll stop there and just say I look forward to working on this model throughout the year and hopefully it will be ready for consideration by November. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. 
So we're going to hear briefly and succinctly from uh, JP from the Campaign for Transformative Therapies. Go ahead, JP. Yeah, just briefly, um, four gene therapies were approved at the end of last year. Each one of those uh, will likely cost in excess of $2 million for the treatment. Now, they're covering uh, extremely rare debilitating diseases, sickle cell, and hemophilia. These arrangements will allow your Medicaid agency to look at this as an issue and to pay for value um, when they're effective and make these decisions and align the incentives between the drug companies and Medicaid in the right direction. So we're strongly supportive of this. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you, Senator. We look forward to further work on this in our coming meetings. If you have any questions, I'd invite you to reach out to Senator Felskowski. Uh, we have one other item on business. Let me go to Representative LaBeouf. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like to propose at a future meeting that we have a conversation about um, innovations in maternal health. Um, there's definitely been some new practices that have been involved, evolving, including birth centers and home visits and some of the insurance um, related matters that, that our practitioners are facing. Okay, thank you for bringing that up. Any other matters of business from the committee? Seeing none, that will conclude us. Thank you for your good work today. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. We have a motion to adjourn. All in favor say aye. aye. As opposed, say no. We stand adjourned. <laughs>